Hello, this is Albert van Dijk, and um, this video is about uh, uh, another use of remote sensing for uh, water management, and that is the use of remote sensing um, to estimate water use or evapotranspiration. And um, one of the really important uh, areas where that is really useful is uh, in irrigation water management. So, at the top uh, pictures here, you see um, uh, just for two different uh, times, so called false color composites. Uh, and we, uh, we dealt with it one of the uh, other videos uh, and you, what it shows is in green uh, areas with very uh, healthy, vigorous uh, crop uh, and in blue areas with open water and um, that's useful but what we really want to know from an irrigation management perspective is how much evapotranspiration, how much water is being used uh, from, from those surfaces. Uh, and, and so that we can have some sense of who is using the water uh, and also what are they using it for. Is it being used to grow crop or is it just uh, evaporating from uh, water storages, for example. And so we need to turn this information uh, into this sort of information where we see uh, uh, in red we see areas with very little evapotranspiration and in blue areas with high evapotranspiration, so high water use rates. Uh, and uh, that's what this video is about. How do we do that? And also the question is then is how do I use that uh, in irrigation weather management? So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how we combine weather observations and satellite observations to estimate evapotranspiration because that's the only way to do it. Uh, and then you might ask yourself how do I then use it? Well you want to combine that probably with some sort of land use classification that tells you where the irrigation areas are for instance if that's your interest. Uh, and then I can, uh, uh, and, and so I might have a dynamic land use map, for instance, also probably from remote sensing. Uh, I can then use it to estimate local water use. And if I then account for other terms, such as uh, drainage, return flows, and so forth, I can start to estimate water use by user period and area. Uh, and um, uh, if I look at other things like transfer loss in the irrigation supply channel, I might actually be able to back out ultimately the amount of river or groundwater that went into this uh, irrigation area. So that's just one of the applications. So how do we estimate it? Well, I already said you do need weather data. Without weather data you can't, cannot do this. Uh, uh, and so one simple way, one of the simplest ways I suppose of estimating uh, water use using remote sensing is by uh, making use of so-called crop factor method. So the crop factor method basically says that the actual water use of the crop, for instance, uh, this crop here, is the uh, product of some reference transpiration rate, um, So that's, and that's typically expressed as the uh, evapotranspiration from a, a, a short, uh, well-watered lawn, which is more or less what this is, uh, uh, times some sort of crop factor, and the crop factor accounts for the difference uh, in, uh, in the plant uh, function between this, this uh, lawn here and this crop. Now previously you would do that with a thing called FAO crop factor method. You'd have a whole bunch of lookup tables at so different times in the year and different crop stages and so forth. Uh, and you would uh, get the numbers out of that table and you'd apply that to a whole uh, field or a whole um, paddock. Now the, uh, the disadvantage of course is that not, that's not only inaccurate but it also doesn't give you any spatial information within your paddock of what's going on. Whether there are maybe places uh, where you get uh, lesser or greater uh, growth and water use going on. Um, and here's an example where we can use remote sensing to estimate the, uh, the crop factor. Uh, and here's the actual crop factor, I suppose. Uh, and uh, and uh, where uh, individual farmers, for instance, can get a sense of how is my uh, paddock faring compared to some of the other paddocks. And so in blue, we see uh, evaporating paddocks, and in dark, in uh, reddish colors, sort of uh, probably not irrigated paddocks. So here's a, a website that the SIRA has developed to do that. A uh, number of years back. Now you can also uh, uh, make that a bit more sophisticated. So you can, the previous example only used NDVI essentially to estimate greenness and from the greenness the crop factor was inferred. Now you can do a little bit better than that because one of the problems with the NDVI is that it doesn't respond to water. Whereas as we saw before, if you've got water at the surface, of course you're going to get very high evaporation rates uh, and uh, you probably want to know about those. Uh, and so one of the algorithms um, that uh, we developed a couple of years ago combines a greenness measure, the EVI in this case, uh, because they have to work a little bit better than the NVI, with a uh, wetness index, essentially an index that uh, uh, 
relates quite closely to the um, wetness of the surface and the presence of open water. Uh, but uh, other than that, it's still essentially more or less a crop factor approach because you multiply it with the reference, you have transpiration. And then in this case, we added a term to estimate rainfall interception, and that's the amount of evaporation from a wet canopy, which is not normally captured in, the, in this uh, crop factor approach. Uh, and um, that worked quite well. And just to give you an idea of, uh, of uh, what these, uh, these indices are, so we've got EVI here on the, on the horizontal axis, and we've got the, uh, the wetness index, the GVMI, uh, on the vertical axis, and then the RMI, which is that which um, gives you an estimate of the uh, residual moisture, which is about, that's why it's called the residual moisture index. Uh, it basically uh, accounts for the relationship that will always more or less exist between GVMI and EVI. It looks at the difference from uh, uh, above that line. And so in blue here, you see all the water surfaces. And um, of course, you need some measure of uh, evapotranspiration to calibrate that method too. And at the time that was done with these um, different flux towers that measure evapotranspiration over an area of uh, about one or two kilometers. Uh, and as you can see, quite quite few different types of uh, vegetation types. And then uh, and again, the parameters of your equation, the constants and the exponents need to be uh, calibrated against your observations. And that was uh, what uh, what this figure shows. Uh, the end result in terms of scatter plot of the uh, predicted versus the observed um, uh, evapotranspiration. And this is typically about as good as it gets. Um, most methods uh, cannot do much better than that. And also in your observations, there's quite a bit of error. Now, you can apply that uh, for irrigation areas, but of course, you can also apply it continentally. And that's what's been done here. And you can start to see some interesting dynamics uh, in the landscape. You see, of course, open water surfaces show up. You see uh, water from time to time pulsing through the channel country, coming from um, further north. Uh, we see in the spring, first the, uh, the uh, pastures on the, on the lower table lands sort of uh, show up. And then later on, the, the trees uh, evaporate more, the forests evaporate more when the grass is senescing. So yeah, there's a lot of things to look at here. Uh, but of course, you cannot um, just uh, map out things by, by looking at things. So uh, one of the, um, the things that has been done with this is to, to turn this information into uh, this data into information on where are water resources uh, being, uh, on average, being produced, uh, and that's what you see here in blue, and where are they uh, on average used, or where uh, is evaporation greater than uh, rainfall, and that's the dark brown areas. Um, and so it's basically just the difference between the annual rainfall and the annual actual evapotranspiration. Uh, why is that useful? Well, then you can really start to look at um, features such as uh, rivers and lakes, but irrigation areas, floodplains, uh, but also potentially groundwater-dependent ecosystems. And that, that was what the particular interest was in this uh, partic particular project, where we wanted to know where there are likely to be groundwater-dependent ecosystems. So this is the workflow that we use there. We use a satellite evapotranspiration. Um, we estimate the uh, dryland evapotranspiration as a function of rainfall only, and then if we do that uh, difference, then we have an estimate of the water that must have come in uh, and added to the total available water that could then be evaporated. Now, that could be because of surface water, and so we had this mapping here of inundation that we used to, uh, to see where water could have come in uh, over land, uh, and then uh, where that was not the case, then we might have some indication that there could be some... Um, some groundwater uh, uh, dependencies and groundwater use. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the result that you get if you do that. So in blue, the areas that uh, receive overland water, in green, the irrigation areas, uh, and then in brown, areas that may well uh, uh, rely to some extent on, uh, on groundwater. And that's been used, and you can find it on the Bureau of Meteorology website as part of the Atlas of Groundwater Dependent Ecosystems. So um, here were two uses, I suppose, and there's many other uses of, uh, of uh, evapotranspiration estimates. Uh, but uh, here we talked about irrigation and about the mapping of groundwater-dependent ecosystems. Again, another uh, application of uh, remote sensing in water management.